pretty good time too. <laughs> I think so. Coming. Um, on behalf of the Center for Digital Scholarship, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome to Brown Tom Scheinfeld, um, who will be speaking today on radical collaboration and emergent knowledge. Uh, Tom's lecture um, is part of the library's series, The Future of Scholarly Publishing, which is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So Tom is Associate Professor of Digital Humanities at the University of Connecticut, where he holds a joint appointment in the Department of Digital Media and Design and the Department of History. Tom is also Director of Greenhouse Studios, uh, Scholarly Communications Design at UConn, a transdisciplinary research unit aimed at reframing the practices, pathways, and products of scholarship in the digital age through inquiry-driven, collaboration-first approaches to the creation and expression of knowledge. Formerly Managing Director of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, Tom has directed several award-winning digital humanities projects, including the September 11th Digital Archive, Batcamp, and Omeka. Trained as a historian of science and a public historian with a bachelor's degree from Harvard and master's and doctoral degrees from Oxford, Tom has written and lectured extensively about the history of museums and the role of history in culture. Tom is a contributor to Debates in Digital Humanities, uh, published by Minnesota, and co-editor with Dan Cohen of Hacking the Academy, New Approaches to Scholarship and Teaching from Digital Humanities, uh, published by Michigan in 2013. I had a, a wonderful morning with Tom, great dynamic conversation. I'm sure you all will enjoy his lecture today, so please join me in welcoming Tom Scheinfeld. Thank you uh, very much. I'm really, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, really, anything to take my mind off the game last night, uh, honestly. Uh, but I am excited to talk about Greenhouse Studios. There's a lot of sympathies um, between what we're trying to do at UConn and what's going on here in the uh, Brown Library. So I, I'm excited to um, continue to explore those connections uh, today. So I'm going to talk about radical collaboration and emergent knowledge. And I'm going to start with the emergent knowledge piece of that. So, let's see. Oh. Sorry. There we go. There we go. All right. So since the 1970s, scholars in fields as varied as geology, ornithology, sociology, philosophy, and many others have come to understand the importance of self-organizing systems, of how higher order complexity can emerge from lower order elements within a system operating independently, when simpler elements in a system operate according to simple rules, they can emerge to higher order complexities. Emergence describes how the how millions of tiny little mud cracks here in a, at the bottom of a dry lake bed can form large-scale geometries when viewed at a distance, or how water molecules, each responding simply to a change in temperature, come to form complex crystalline patterns in snowflakes. Emergence describes how hundreds of birds, like these here, each following its own relatively simple rules of behavior can self-organize into a flock that displays its own complex behaviors, behaviors that none of the individual birds themselves would display on their own. In the words of writer Stephen Johnson, Emergence describes how those birds, without a master plan or without any executive leadership from one or a committee of the birds, go from being a they to being an it 
go from being just a bunch of birds in a tree to being a flock that operates as a unit. In other words, emergence describes a becoming. So we also form emergent systems, we human beings. Emergence describes, for instance, how a crowd of pedestrians self-organizes to form complex traffic flows on a busy sidewalk. Viewed close up, right, from your own point of view as a, as a person in this crowd, each pedestrian is just trying to put one foot in front of the other. Each person is just trying to get to his or her destination without getting trampled by the rest of the crowd. Each person is just reacting to the immediate stimulus in front of him or her. Each one is following just a relatively simple set of rules of behavior, right? Don't smash into the person in front of you, right? Walk on the right, not on the left. Those kinds of very simple rules. And that's what we see when we view it from street level. But viewed from above, however, we see a structured flow. Right? We see a river of humanity. We see a system with its own ebbs and flows, its own complexities, its own patterns, its own organization. So in this example, we see how acting without any direction, just following a relatively simple set of rules, the crowd spontaneously organizes itself, spontaneously <coughs> orders itself into a complex system for maximizing pedestrian traffic. The mass of individual actors, the uncoordinated they, has, without anyone in charge, without a concerted plan, spontaneously become a productive it. At Greenhouse Studios, the new unit that I direct at UConn, we're interested in what new knowledge might emerge when we allow academic communities to self-organize. We're asking what kinds of higher order complexities emerge when teams of faculty members, students and staff, humanists, artists, and librarians are given permission to set and follow their own simple rules of collaboration. At Greenhouse Studios, we're running an experiment in radical collaboration, removing the labor hierarchies and predetermined work plans that normally structure collaborative scholarly projects. Instead, we're allowing the collaborations to structure themselves. Now, this model of self-organization, of radical collaboration, stands in what I think is fairly strong rebuke to what I would call the additive model of collaboration that draws resources and people together to serve a particular faculty member's own project where a single faculty member is the driving impetus and organizing impetus behind the collaboration. Instead, at Greenhouse Studios, we're exploring what we call an inquiry-driven collaboration first. And I'll say that again, because I'm going to say it a bunch. Inquiry-driven collaboration first model of project development that embraces the emergent qualities of collaboration itself. Now, collaboration has been a byword of digital humanities and digital scholarship since very nearly the inception of the field, right? We talk about collaboration a lot. We say that the complexity of producing digital works requires scholars to work in close proximity to or closely with designers, developers, digital librarians, editors, and others, right? We say that no one person has it within him or herself to all the skills and all the talents and all the time necessary to produce a work of digital scholarship. But when we look closer, we see that that collaboration amongst those many actors, and it is real and it is true, but that collaboration among these many actors happens actually fairly late in the research and publication workflow. Right? After the scholar has completed the bulk of her research, maybe, well after the initial idea for the project. Digital humanists are often, and these are mainly faculty digital humanists, 
are often told even to go to the end of your re own resources. Do as much as you can by yourself before you start bringing on collaborators, before you go and talk to a librarian, before you go and talk to an editor, before you bring on a designer. Do it yourself as far as you can, and then start bringing on collaborators. Exhaust your own individual resources before you engage others. That's the advice. I've given that advice. I've given that advice many times. But this prevalence of late stage collaboration where collaborators are brought on well into the research and development process is something that librarians often suffer with. Right? This is something that librarians have often commented on Librarians being the people who are often called upon at that late stage after a lot of the decisions have been made to do the work on the project. Bethany Nowitzki of the Digital Library Federation, for example, has written about the poor outcomes that emerge when the relationship of librarians and other skilled practitioners to digital scholarship is conceived of in terms of service as opposed to organic collaboration. And in fact, in this respect, the collaborative trajectory from research to end product is in fact remarkably, remarkably similar for digital scholarship to that of traditional scholarship. People to works such as books and articles where we collaborate when we write a book. We just collaborate way, way, way at the end when it goes off to the publisher. It's backed up a little bit in the standard digital publication workflow, but it's not backed up all the way to the beginning by any means. And given the humanities longstanding configuration around the production of physical texts, it's really no surprise, right? It's no surprise that despite the changing technologies of publication that, and communication, that many of the basic workflows and hierarchies of scholarly communications have remained intact intact. Uh, John Mackenzie Owen has described a deeply rooted information chain model of knowledge dissemination in which the chain of scholarship begins with an author, passes through to a publisher, and culminates in the provision of access by librarians and ultimate use by readers. And in this information chain model of knowledge dissemination, communications between these actors in the chain occurs mainly, if not only, at points of handoff. And while the introduction of digital tools across the chain has altered activities from research and writing on through preservation and reading, it is not reconfigured to a very large extent. The larger workflow in which the various actors remain interlinked, but largely independent, save for these key transactional handoff moments. This transactional model of scholarship development has contributed to the persistence of what I see as an increasingly detrimental division of activities into those of knowledge creation, or the domain side, what we might call the domain side, and those of production, or what we might call the build side. Right? This division is more than conceptual, right? It's reflected, for instance, in humanities workspaces, funding, and our interactions. The architecture, for instance, of humanities scholarship, departmental floors, right? Departmental floors or buildings with long hallways of private offices create spaces where the best opportunities for collaboration are offered by the hallways themselves, not by the main functional spaces of the building. The predominant model of funding humanities work, for instance, is likewise conceived around the need for sequestered work. The very purpose of most fellowships in the humanities is to remove the scholar from her fellows for a semester or two. To remove the scholar from collaborations for an extended period of time for individual focus and study. 
And even when a scholar is engaged in producing a work of digital or other non-traditional scholarship, this handoff habit is so well ingrained and the work of the build side so well black boxed that many faculty remain isolated from developers, designers, editors, librarians, and other experts necessary to the production of this digital work, even as they're making the fundamental decisions about things such as appropriate media, software packages, and metadata schemas. We decide before we talk to anybody that the project is going to be a website, or it's going to be a digital archive, or it's going to be a game. The issues presented by print-focused workflows are, of course, manifested in and entwined with and exacerbated by academic labor hierarchies. The emphasis on transactional relationships and the naturalization of the domain-build divide reify existing frameworks that give visibility to some kinds of academic labor while misrecognizing or discounting other kinds of academic labor. <clears throat> the most common form of this uneven power relationship is between faculty and librarians, but it also exists, for example, within the library, among credentialed librarians and technical staff, between tenure-track faculty and non-tenure-track faculty, between editors and authors, and between faculty and students. Right? There are lots of these hierarchies, overlapping, intersecting hierarchies of academic labor. Additionally, the supposed doing activities, programming, design, database development, etc., are often cast as separate and to, uh, separate from and subordinate to the thinking activities, right? Research, analysis, synthesis, and writing. Even in the realm of digital scholarship where collaborative undertakings are more the norm, early and vigorous debates, right, in digital humanities from 10 years ago, 15 years ago, pitted hack versus yak, theory versus practice, scholarship versus service. In recent years, digital humanists have roundly acknowledged that the binary structuring much of that conversation didn't really present an accurate picture, although at the time they did raise the visibility of contributions of technical labor. Today's digital humanities community recognizes that hacking involves yakking, and yakking involves hacking, but this consensus has not, I don't think, filtered down or out into academia more broadly. And although digital humanists have recognized the corrosiveness of these binaries, a practical workflow to challenge them has not yet been developed. Greenhouse Studios is dedicated to addressing these persistent and intertwined problems of workflow and hierarchy, with a research mission that equally values all stakeholders involved in producing scholarship, that flattens traditional academic hierarchies, and that systematizes the collaboration and production of multimodal scholarship by implementing an inquiry-driven, collaboration-first model of scholarly production that places continuous, close, and equitable communication between all of the kinds of labor that are required to produce a work of digital scholarship at the very heart of our mission. All too often, collaborators are brought on board to implement scholarly projects, not to imagine them. Greenhouse Studios aims to change this by pushing collaboration on traditional as well as digital scholarship upstream in the research and publication workflow to the very headwaters of imagination, inquiry, and project conception. This collaboration first approach brings scholars together with designers, developers, editors, and librarians to start new projects, not merely to finish them to allow the emergent properties 
of the collaboration itself to produce the new knowledge. Now, this inquiry-driven collaboration first model has its origins both, both in some past experience that uh, I and my collaborators have had on, uh, on past projects, and also based on some uh, new research that we've done. Emergent approaches to scholarly communication have long been an interest of mine, although I've only recently come to think of them in that way. Um, my first experiment in the emergent possibilities of radical collaboration took the form of something called that camp, the Humanities and Technology Camp, which was an unconference that my colleagues at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media and I launched in 2008, 10 years ago. Um, and we'll be actually holding that camp X uh, in Fairfax uh, this summer, barring the X from Apple. Um, we were thinking one day at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, me and Jeremy Boggs and Dave Lester, two students, and, uh, and Dan Cohen and Josh Greenberg, uh, about how we might go about reducing the overhead of face-to-face -face scholarly communication, right? We were wondering why it was that academic conferences cost so damn much, right? Why the AHA, for instance, or the MLA, uh, which really is geared to getting people together in a room together, um, so that's like the ultimate function of those meetings. Why it took, you know, each meeting took five or ten years of planning. The hotels are booked five or ten years out. Um, think of the cost of all of the plane flights for the 5,000 people who go to MLA. For everybody in the country to fly to San Diego uh, and spend a week in a hotel room. Um, we were thinking about how that, that enormous cost, um, the kind of drain that that had, and not just the, kind of, not just the financial cost, the cost in time, the cost in sort of psychic energy, right? It just is like, they're stressful places, they're stressful to plan, they're stressful to organize, they're stressful to attend, right? Like, just thinking about that overhead in monetary, structural, and psychic terms of, of academic conferences, and drawing on models that were sort of hot at the time from Silicon Valley, Food Camp, and Bar Camp, we wondered if we could draw down the costs of getting together to their lowest possible level. We came up with this idea for that camp where people would find their own hotel rooms. People would find their own transportation to the place. We wouldn't have a program committee. Right? We, wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have organized sessions. We would get people together in a room and we would allow them to self-organize. The participants would set their own program. They would establish their own goals for the meeting. They would conduct their own sessions without direction from us. We would provide a few things. We'd provide space, we'd provide coffee, and we'd provide a set of ground rules that people could, should follow to make their interactions go a little more smoothly. And from this simple set of rules, right, emerged this thing called that camp. At first, it was a single meeting, a single unconference, but it was one that was repeated, right? So that camp itself, the first that camp, was a self-organizing system. But that camp, as a larger movement, like the Olympic movement, let's say, um, was itself self-organizing, right? People could take that model and reproduce it. And over the last 10 years, <coughs> There have been hundreds of that camps all over the world, all self-organized. And this is all self-sustaining. We had some relatively small melon money to set up a website to let people put up conference, um, uh, put up dates and, and organize, organize um, their, their groups. We printed a lot of stickers and swag to get people um, excited. Um, we provided somebody to answer the phone if people had questions about how this all worked. But other than that, these were self-organizing and self-perpetuating. Uh, and that camp is still running as a self-sustaining community. Um, there are, I 
haven't looked recently, but there are probably several that camps happening this month somewhere uh, in the world. And we don't do anything like, to manage that. It happens. Now, another experiment uh, with this emergent approach um, that we ran a little bit after that camp, first in 2010 and again in 2013, was a project called One Week, One Tool. This was a twice-funded uh, experiment um, by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the, the Institutes for Advanced Topics in Digital Humanities, which brought together a diverse collection of scholars, students, programmers, designers, librarians, administrators, um, artists, etc., to conceive, build, and launch an entirely new software tool for digital scholarship, for humanities scholarship, within just one week. Participants arrived at this institute without an idea of what they would build, only the knowledge or the trust, the faith, that the assembled team would possess the necessary range of talent for the undertaking. Right? So we brought, we put out a call for applicants, asked people to email us to say, we didn't have strict criteria, it was, tell us why this sounds interesting to you. Tell us why this experiment sounds interesting to you. Um, and we chose people um, not for particular skills or particular scholarly achievements, not for particular letters after their name, um, but for things like enthusiasm, a track record of collaboration, um, a track record of getting things done. And we chose, in each case, in 2010 and 2013, 12 people. We brought them to Fairfax, Virginia, um, and we put them in a room together. And we began by brainstorming what we might build. And after a day of trying to decide where the collective interests of the group lay and what kinds of things they could do together, what kinds of capabilities they had in themselves, what kinds of interests they wanted to put those capabilities to, we came up with an idea, spent the next six days, we built it, and we released it. Right? And we built, in both cases, in seven days, a piece of maybe production level scholar, uh, 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 software, it's maybe a little too much, but working pieces of software that could be used by real users. In 2010, it was a WordPress plugin called Anthologize to take your blog and turn it into a book, and in 2013, it was something called Serendipomatic. Um, a specialized search engine to approximate for web users the serendipity of working in physical archives. And both have found enthusiastic audiences, and both are used daily by people out there on the web. So in both cases, that camp and one week, one tool, we found that putting people together letting themselves organize, providing some structure, very simple structures, some very simple rules by which they should interact, could achieve interesting, novel, unexpected complexity, unexpected results. That new knowledge could emerge from the collective. Now, when my colleague Clarissa Siglio and I, Clarissa Siglio and I a Brown alum, uh, moved from George Mason in 2013 to the Yukon School of Fine Arts Digital Media and Design Department, we began to see some similarities between this mode of work we stumbled upon in that camp and in One Week, One Tool to certain arts and design-based approaches, to certain arts and design-based methodologies that were more native, more familiar, uh, to our new colleagues working in areas such as theater, interactive media, and industrial design. Subsequent research into this literature of design thinking and theater production in particular, as it's been applied in, in the arts and industry and other sectors, led us to situate our existing work within this kind of larger framework articulated by the arts. And yet, the limitations of, and sort of the cultural differences between these industry-based approaches, you've probably seen 
this design, this kind of design thinking literature by sort of the IDO Bay Area consultancy. Um, the limitations and kind of cultural differences between these industry-based approaches and even art-based approaches um, to design thinking and the sometimes facile way that, in particular, that design thinking is uh, adopted by the corporate world led us to dig a little deeper into the ways that this kind of methodology was being um, employed in other sectors, sectors maybe a little closer to home. So we did, with the first of our Mellon planning grants, um, we went out and we did an awful lot of research um, looking at design-based approaches in libraries, design-based approaches in engineering departments, um, design-based approaches uh, in community maker spaces, uh, design-based approaches um, in even university presses. And we took that under our belt as well. So we have our experience in one week, one tool on that camp. We have this design thinking literature. We have this research that we've done in these different experiments closer to home. And with that, we went through a process, with all that work done, we went through a process of what we called mental model. So what we did was, with all that as background, we talked to all of the people who would be involved in a, in a digital scholarship workflow. So we did interviews with web designers, programmers, and we talked to archivists, and we talked to GIS librarians, and we talked to um, historians and lit scholars, and we talked to uh, graduate student assistants, and sort of the range of folks, undergraduates, the range of folks that might be involved in a, um, in a digital scholarship workflow. And we asked them to describe their creative process, right? Like, how do you get from the beginning to the end of producing whatever it is you produce? What is your process? And we asked them to, they could write it out as, a, as an email, they could draw it as a, uh, as a, as a, as a, a diagram, they could give us a set of bullet points, they could describe this process in whatever way it felt most comfortable to them. And we took these mental models, and we lined them all up, and we tried to find places of harmony between them, right? Where these mental models overlap, where these processes, these creative processes, amongst these um, different kinds of academic labor, where they Overlapped. And we found lots of areas of overlap. But what we found was that people were being brought in to the overall process at very different times. So the process by which a, let's say, faculty historian goes from, let's say, giving a brief conference presentation to putting that together into a published journal article right, maybe conference paper proposal to publish journal article, is fairly similar to the way that a web developer goes about thinking about how to take, you know, a, a blank text editor and turning it into production software. The steps that they go through are fairly similar. Um, but when it comes to digital scholarship, the, the faculty member thinks on this scale, but the web designer is only brought in at this point, and the archivist is only brought in at that point at the end. Right? But they're doing the same thing. And we thought, what if we could describe a process where everyone was doing the same activities at the same time? Right? Everybody was going through that process at the same time. And what if we could come up with language that would describe that, which would be as meaningful to all the different players um, as it was to any one of the players, or maybe as, as meaning less, um, as the case may be. But what if we could describe a process that would work for all of the people in the information chain. So these main points of harmony in the mental models of our collaborator archetypes, these designers, editors, scholars, developers, digital librarians, 
became the main development cycles of what came to be our new design process model. This collaboration first process model that would put everybody necessary to the project in the room at the same time. So I want to walk through this fairly quickly um, to describe how Greenhouse Studios projects work and how they differ from traditional scholarly workflows. So what happens in a Greenhouse Studios project? And this is a roughly two year time frame that we work on. What we do is we start with people, right? We start with a group of people, a team of, a diverse team of maybe a couple of faculty members, a couple of graduate students, a couple of librarians, maybe one of them's an artist, maybe one of them's a developer, maybe one of them's a designer, right? One of them is a subject area, subject area expert, right? They all come with different and diverse talents and skills. We get this group of people together, we assemble them, and we drop in what we call an inquiry prompt. This is like the kind of thing you'd give a class of students when you're writing an essay. Like, here's what your essay is about. You go do that. Um, we give that to the group, right? And so this team of people assembles around this inquiry prompt. And the inquiry prompt comes from the outside. The inquiry prompt comes from Greenhouse Studios. It doesn't come from one member of the team or another. It doesn't come from the faculty member. The faculty member doesn't come to us and say, I really want to do a project on you know, 18th century French architecture. They, we get the team together and we give them a prompt. Now, we select the team, right? We, we, we get people who we think might be interested in the prompt, who may have something to say about the prompt, but the, the team, um, the team doesn't apply to the prompt. We apply the team to the prompt, right? So the team gets together in this assemble phase. Um, and they get, to, they get to know each other. And they come out the other end, and they enter into the first phase of our design process, which is what we call understand. And in this phase of the process, the team um, tries to do a couple of things. They try to, first and foremost, understand the prompt. What does this prompt mean? to them. What, how do they understand it? How does their experience, their knowledge, their training affect their ideas about that prompt? What do they bring to this prompt? We also try to get a handle on understanding what each team member brings to the collaboration. Right? What are the skills of everyone in the room? What are, what's the background of everyone in the room? And we think of that holistically, right? So you aren't the designer on the team. You are a person on the team, right? You bring design skills to the team, but you also may be a gardener, right? And you bring that to the team as well. And maybe, who knows, maybe the team will use your gardening skills, right? So you bring, we try to understand the whole person, right? We try to understand what all of these people bring to the collaboration, all of their many talents, skills, and interests. We also try to understand, so not just the kinds of resources that people bring to the team, but also their constraints, right? And this is something that too often is, I think, missed in um, planning for collaborative projects. What are people's time constraints, right? What are their attention constraints? What are their family constraints? What can't they do? And collectively, what can't the team do, right? So we haven't decided at this stage, we haven't even really talked about at this stage, what we're building. Right? We're not even thinking about, oh, this will be a website, or this will be a musical performance, or this will be a, uh, an exhibition. Or We don't know what we're building. We're just trying to get a, gra a hand on who we are and what we bring to the collaboration. But we do, by the end of this, know that, like, let's say nobody on the team is a web developer. We do know that we're probably not going to build a website, right? If nobody on the team can play an instrument, there probably isn't going to be any music in what we build. So we get a handle on resources and constraints. From there comes the project brief, where we define um, in very broad terms and kind of um, very open terms the kinds of aims we want to achieve, the kinds of 
um, things we think we can do with this prompt, the kinds of understandings we have of the prompt. We describe our resources, our constraints. Um, and uh, we start to think about, it's almost like um, shooting an arrow. We don't know where we're headed yet. We don't know exactly what the arrow is going to hit, but we know we want to shoot it over in that direction. So we have a project brief. We move on to this identify phase where we start to do additional work to come to some firmer understandings of what it is we're going to build. So this is where we start to talk about media formats. This is where we start to talk about um, particular subject matter. This is where we start to do additional research that needs to be done. So we know we want, you know, we know we want to, to shoot our arrow over there. But what do we need to know about that direction in order to do our work more effectively? So the idea starts to solidify into what we call the creative brief, or we used to call a functional spec, which actually, in that stage, then describes what it is we're going to build, and describes things like timetables and milestones and project plans for building it. So we spend a long time, this is about six months, we spend a long time just getting to know each other and our subject matter before we decide on exactly what it is we're going to do. What we don't want to do here is foreclose a whole bunch of possible avenues of exploration or um, production by settling too early on a particular media format or a particular project idea. We leave that open-ended for a while so, and until we get to this creative brief. We move then into the build phase, which is kind of an iterative, agile development phase for the project. Um, where we, you know, prototype, test, refine, prototype, test, refine. This is about a year. This is kind of the big meaty middle of the, of the process. We end up here with what we call the media manuscript, which is, and we use that term because we don't know what media this thing's going to be, but we do know that it's going to be in the stage where if it were a book, you might be sending it off to the press for peer review and revision. In each of these you know, in each of these project brief and the creative brief, we, we come to firmer understandings also of what kind of peer review might happen, right? What peer review might look like for this product we're building, and it'll look different, right? If it's an edited volume that the team decides to build, that, the peer review for that will look different than the peer review for a puppet show, right? Which it could be. But in each case, a peer review mechanism is described and planned for. I should mention, um, on many of the teams, we include a member, uh, uh, like an acquisitions editor, from a university press um, who can help us think about these kinds of things. They also include, very importantly, librarians who help us think about these kinds of things, long-term preservation and access, assessment, and dissemination. So after peer review, it goes off to release. And one thing we keep open is that the team together will build a project and take co-ownership and co-authorship of the project. But all team members are also empowered to go off and do their own things with the collective work. So if you want to write a journal article for your field on this, you're welcome to do that. So this is roughly a two-year process. We launched about a year ago as a new interdisciplinary, interdepartmental unit. We're um, not, we are, we like to say we're in the library, but we're not of the library. The library is one of our three constituent um, uh, units. The others are the School of Fine Arts and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. All three units have made space or money or staff investments in Greenhouse Studios. Um, all three sit on our steering committee. Um, so there are three members from each of those three units on, on our steering committee who help define our work and very importantly choose our prompts. Right? The steering committee decides on the prompts. Um, and those three units help us to put interdisciplinarity and collaboration really at the center of what we do. All of our teams include um, uh, 
participants from those, those three units. Um, each of the teams includes uh, a facilitator from Greenhouse Studios who runs the meeting and includes a project manager from Greenhouse Studios who helps keep things moving. But then it includes librarians, artists, humanists from the departments, the units that make up Greenhouse Studios. Each team has about eight people on it. And so we're in the process of staffing up and moving into our, our new space. And even as we are, we are about a year into our first cohort of projects. Greenhouse Studios projects, the way we've got it arced out, start in January and go through two years, December. So we're about halfway through our first cohort of three projects. Cohort A, we're just starting this month, our, the understand phase of our cohort B projects. Um, and I can show you a little bit from these, these projects. Um, the first uh, three projects all responded to uh, a prompt called the limits of text. Um, and that prompt was sort of chosen intentionally to get people thinking about new modalities. Um, other prompts, uh, because we wanted to kind of flex our, our muscles in that, in that uh, first cohort. Others will invite even textual products. But these first limits of text products are three. Um, the first one is a project on um, transnational Cuban culture um, in uh, Havana and Miami. Um, it, uh, the team was, consisted of a, uh, a Spanish professor, a Cuban filmmaker, um, a, some photography students, uh, let's see, um, our, uh, our Spanish language librarian, forgetting the rest of the team. But um, they got together and what they decided to produce was a, um, a set of short 16 millimeter films um, that, uh, that they are almost finished with. One of them has been accepted into, I can't tell you where or when, but accepted uh, for, for showing at a prominent uh, international film festival. So we're really excited about that. Um, but again, the, the team came together and decided what it is they were going to build based on who was in the room, what their skills were. We didn't tell them what to build. And in fact, until very close to the end, they were going to build a digital archive um, until they decided they didn't want to build a digital archive. They wanted So until that creative brief was written, they were really working on a digital archive idea um, until something in the group flipped and they decided, no, what we want to do is make films. So they made films. Uh, and and we're, we're getting ready to release those. Our second uh, team is uh, working with actually a, an archival collection uh, at the Yukon Archives. It's the um, papers, and actually we have some of her paintings as well, the papers of a uh, early 20th century portraitist, Ellen Emmett Rand. Um, she painted mostly um, uh, prominent businessmen and politicians. Um, and her story is interesting from a lot of perspectives. Um, um, in particular, the, the kind of position of the female artist in relationship to the male body in the, in the early 20th century. Um, and we've got on this team a web designer, we have an illustrator, we have um, an archivist, we have an art historian. Uh, and they are going to, uh, they're in the process of producing a, an illustrated this isn't, they would not like this description of it, but it's basically like an illustrated choose your own adventure um, book for children about the choices that uh, women artists had to make um, in the early 20th century. And so, you know, Ellen Emmett Rand had to make a set of choices about the kind of art she was going to do, her social position, her family, her, her reproduction, all this stuff. And this choose your own adventure will allow people to go in different directions. And you may like end up as, like if she had made other choices, all of a sudden, oh, now you're Georgia O'Keeffe, right? Um, so, uh, so, so this is, this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, we'll see where, where that goes. That one's a little bit uh, further, further behind. Um, and then our third project is a, uh, uh, a project that is exploring the coronation mass of uh, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V in 1530. 
Um, this is the team I'm facilitating, so this is the one I'm most excited about. Um, and this team brings together a music professor, a uh, 3D animation professor, um, a, uh, a motion graphics graduate student, um, uh, this guy, Tom Lee, who's uh, one of our Greenhouse Studio staff member who has degrees in computer science um, and uh, also in trumpet, jazz trumpet. Um, and so um, what this team is going to do is uh, they're building a virtual reality reconstruction of the coronation mass of uh, Charles V. Um, that's going to be an architectural um, reconstruction, but it's also going to be a reconstruction of the ceremony, a reconstruction of the music. We've already done um, a reconstruction of the music and recorded the, the original mass. Um, uh, and so we're, we've done the photography in, in Italy and everything, so we're, we're moving along on that. That's going to be um, hopefully done in the next six months or so. That will be, and that, the audience for this is primarily um, undergraduate um, history classes, music history, um, um, art history, and, and others. The idea is we're going to um, release it not just as a kind of Oculus Rift, heavy duty virtual reality experience, but also a um, like a Google Cardboard experience that um, could be used in the in the classroom on a, on a, on a smartphone. So um, we're we're working on that. So that's. Um, Cohort A, those are three projects. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, geez, oh, yes. All right, let me just say, um, we're, we're launching our Cohort B teams. Um, there's gonna be six projects in Cohort B. We hope to run, we hope to be running at any given time, once we're fully staffed and up and running, 12 concurrent projects at any time, each on a two-year timeline, staggered, six projects, launched six projects a year. Um, these teams are responding to three prompts. Humility and conviction in public life is one prompt. Uh, indigeneity is another prompt. And yes and is the third prompt. Um, so that's where we stand. Um, we're very excited to see what emerges from these uh, collaborations. And um, we uh, hope we can share it with you again when we're a little further along. Thank you very much. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Um, I'll open the floor. Yep, Patrick. Um, thanks, Tom. That was great. Um, thanks, so, so one of the recollections I have from the One Week, One Tool experience was that that was kind of terrifying. I was on the development side. Was that you launched um, like pretty much a half or a third of the team was dedicated to doing outreach that happened like basically started right away. And uh, that was horrifying when the thing wasn't built. Um, but it was actually a really interesting approach that I think really worked well in the context of that kind of a, a high pressure situation. And I was just wondering, like, um, how you handle outreach for these projects? Is it, does it similarly, like, go off with a bang at the beginning? Or where are you, in, where are you starting to uh, introduce it? Um, so, so one of the differences with One Week, One Tool, so like with One Week, One Tool, I think we were probably more involved as the Center for History and New Media, as the organizers, than we are with these teams in assigning duties, right? So these teams manage that with, you know, with advice and assistance for themselves. They decide how they're going to manage outreach. So it will depend, first of all, who's on the team. Um, but it'll also depend what they're building and when they think it makes sense to start. But there will be people on the team who are, and it will be part of the conversation to be talking about dissemination early on. As it will be, there'll be people on the team um, who will be, by the, by the skills that they bring, by their bearing, um, thinking about things like preservation and access from the beginning, right? So they're all there at the start of the process. So it, it may not be quite as like, you know, like you start doing dissemination and outreach right at the beginning, but you're at least talking about it. You're at least thinking about it um, from, from the very start. Yeah. The, the skills are in the room at the beginning uh, to, be, to be dealing with that. So it's not just like at the end, it's like, okay, so who's gonna market this for me, right? It's, that's part of the design 
process. Thanks for the presentation. I, I, I love new ways of thinking about starting with different kinds of constraints than we're normally used to. Um, one question about the, the overall flow that you showed, that, that particular slide. You mentioned that the building process happens, happens in, in an iterative way, and I'm a developer and that automatically appeals to me. Um, but um, one question I have is, is that there was an aspect of it that felt a little bit of the old water flowish, waterfallish thing in the sense that sometimes as one builds things, you can really get a sense that you might want to go in a different direction. And it sounds like in that flow, the, the, the brief has been set, and now you're iteratively building, yes. but can, so they, can they inform each other? It's, that's, a, that's, that, that's a comment that I get a lot from developers. So one of the things, and we probably, first of all, we're iterating our design process model. But second of all, one of the things that I don't think the design process, the, the visual, um, or maybe I, communicated very well is, those circles are intended and that sign curve is intended to communicate that you can go back, right? So the team, and in fact, that's sort of what happened with that, that Fino team, that's what they call themselves, the Cuban, transnational Cuban community. Um, they sort of were in the early stages of build when they were starting this digital archive and they scrapped it and went back to the creative brief. And so, those, so that creative brief and that project brief, those to themselves are iterative documents. That's why we have this kind of circle thing. But yes, that's absolutely true, right? You may decide halfway through the build phase that you, you, need, to, you need to rethink. So we, we intend the whole curve to be iterative and not just the build. Yeah. But also finite. But what? But also finite. It, yes, so one of the things we, one of the, the subtitle of our Mellon grant is uh, something like collaborative scholarship at scale. <laughs> um, and so one of the things we're trying to work out is how to do 12 concurrent projects at once. Um, and for that, they need to be on a timeline. And so the, the products have to be constrained to some extent, right? Like, not everything is going to be monograph sized. Um, and that, it may be, or it may be that at the end of the, at the, end of the thing, they have an interim product, like, instance, a grant proposal. <laughs> um, so we're, we're working through those, those issues because, yeah, that, 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 that time constraint is a, is a tough one. Steve? Fascinating set of projects. I'm most interested in that middle one you talked about that was based on a collection in the library. I'm thinking about this as a model for library collections and using them. Could you say more about how that group chose that collection or was that something that was sort of a new collection that was being looking for, for a new use? Or is there a way to say, to, to redefine this as a project of, we've got this group of collections that we're interested in. Can we build things around them? So yes, so that great, great question. So that one um, emerged from the, the archivist is that she's in charge of that collection. And we had a 20th century um, uh, um, art historian on the team who does women's Women's art history. So like that, that, that came out. But for our cohort C, we're going to experiment with two different kinds of prompts. The collection as prompt and the physical location as prompt. So, we're, so we have this old set of buildings, the Cheney Mills in Manchester, Connecticut. That, and, and that's the prompt. Yep. Right? We're just going to say to the team. Yeah. So that's what they're, and same with the collection. Um, so we are experimenting with those kinds of sort of physical material problems. Um, and this partly comes out of Clarissa's interest, your student. So, yeah, Harriet. It's an interesting process, and it's, um, it, it's like an a experimental environment. And it uh, requires, I think, especially faculty to suspend um, the way in which they might normally um, create a piece of scholarship, whatever that end result might be. Um, I can see how it would be attractive to faculty and to others in this kind of experimental environment and mode and so on. But the reality of pressures of uh, getting tenure, of 
not having lots of time, you didn't talk about time commitment, that would be an interesting thing of how many hours a week or whatever do they meet. But it does seem slightly improbable um, to become a, um, a method uh, that could be used. I think the concept of teaching and kind of requiring um, partners to work together and to think together, I mean, that's, that's very valuable. But um, what do you kind of hope for long term? So, OK, so yes. So it is experiment. I mean, it is, and we, we, we make no bones about that. Um, will this become the dominant way that history departments operate? Probably not. And we're not, that's not what we're, we're trying to do. Um, we're certainly not trying to um, get rid of the old ways. And it's not going to be for everyone either. Um, and you mentioned like tenure and promotion. So one of the things we're doing at the beginning is we're not working with assistant professors. We're working with newly tenured associate professors, people who are you know, in a position to take a flyer on this weird thing that we're doing. Um, so, so yes, so the other pressures are, are, are real and, and we, we recognize them. Um, at the same time, if we are going to get our hands around new media, right, new modes of communication, we're going to have to, and that's, this is going to involve people across the university, we're going to have to get our hands around new workflows, which, is going, which means people are going to have to, some of them at least, change their behaviors. Um, they're going to have to change their commitments. They're going to have to behave in new ways. Um, I don't know if this is the way they're going to have to behave, but I do know they're going to have to behave differently. Trying to graft new media onto old modes of production, I know is not going to work. So, so we are trying, so it's, a, so it's a back and forth. It's, we're trying to model some new ways of working. Maybe this will work for some people, maybe it won't. Um, or maybe it won't work for others. But, but if we're going to change the kinds of things we're producing, we're going to have to change the kinds of work we do. The, the interesting thing is that um, scientists, in so many ways, have uh, embraced this uh, new approach. Uh, and not all publications are able to accommodate the range of outputs that scientists make, and we have encountered that here at Brown even, uh, needing to support access to video and certain kinds of data and so on. But, you know, I, I think it would be so interesting to talk about uh, or to study the, the reasons, the ways, I don't know what, how science has really become what we used to call e-science. I mean, it is science today, and it is deeply, uh, technology and digital work is deeply embedded in that, in ways that we are still trying to yes. uh, uh, find for the humanity. I find that, um, I mean, you know, scientists have their own problems with labor hierarchies and other things. But I do find that this kind of mode of production and this mode of collaboration, um, it clicks with scientists a lot easier than it does with humanists. Humanists have a, more of a kind of resistance to it. it with performing artists, it, I mean, they don't flinch at this, right? Um, you know, the band, how they work. <laughs> um, so so it's, it's interesting to see different disciplines reacting differently to, to this. And, and it is a tough nut to crack among the humanities, yeah. If what I like about it is that it's light. This particular iteration of it, if you will, is, is light on the faculty in some ways. I don't know any faculty member in whatever, however traditional um, their practice is, that doesn't have some kind of smaller side project going, whether it's, you know, you, you, can, you can just think of them yourself. Um, and that includes the assistant profs. Um, everybody's working on their big project, yes. but they always, everybody always has some smaller project 
that they could collaborate on that would if you help them find the collaborators that that it isn't it doesn't take all your time uh, it isn't but but this sort of opens up some possibilities for a, a, a different a, a, a project in a different valence or a different kind of project these that, are not single author right it's like these are not your book right as the faculty yeah book. that's not they're not intended to be they they may be that size yeah. in the end because of the labor that other people have put in it but in many ways you're right it's light on the faculty and it treats uh, it treats the faculty as and we tend not to we, we banish the word scholar from our our lingo we just don't like that because it privileges that kind of expertise above all these other kinds of expertise. Um, we try not even to talk about faculty. We often talk about subject matter expert, right? So the faculty is providing a certain kind of expertise, a certain kind of labor to the project that's not really any more important or less important than the other kinds of labor that go into the project. So, and that can be a kind of difficult position for faculty members who are used to sort of single author scholarship. Following up on various questions, how much time are the various people all putting into this? And then the other part of that is how are students involved? Right. So, um, okay, first of all, so the each team has a Greenhouse Studios um, project manager who has three projects that they're in charge of. Um, so they're like a third on the project, and that's a postdoc. That's a humanities postdoc. Um, each, uh, each has a, what we call a design technologist, which is the primary maker on the project. And those are Greenhouse Studios employees. They each have like five or six projects. Um, so they're putting in, you know, whatever it is, 12% of their time to each project. They're full-time employees. Uh, each has a, a graduate, student, graduate student assistant. And each graduate student assistant has three projects. So they're putting in what, 20 hours a week divided by three, right? So they're putting in six hours a week or something. Um, then the other people on the project, um, the facilitator, which is somebody from the Greenhouse Studios leadership, like me, I'm putting in occasional work on the project. I run meetings, basically. Um, and then these couple, there's usually like subject, we call them in residence experts, and those are subject matter experts, librarians other kinds of expert technical expertise. Um, there's three or four of those. Um, and they're probably contributing, I would say, 15 hours a month, 20 hours a month. So I mean, not an insignificant amount of time, but kind of side project amount of time, five hours a week, something like that. Yeah. Um, and that includes meeting time. So you know, and it's more intensive during that build phase, which we've planned to take place mainly in the middle summer. So, you know, we provide them a little bit of money to stick around campus during the summer to do, do this. This is what they're, instead of taking their research trip to France this summer, they're gonna stick around campus and do this instead. Um, so they, they end up putting in more time over the summer. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, it, these, because we're doing it at scale, they're, they're more constrained. And we'll, we'll see how that plays out. We don't know exactly how big or how small these will will um, pan out to be. Sometimes we sort of say, we, we, we try to say, well, they're probably not gonna be as big as monograph projects. Like, they're probably not gonna be that big. But they're probably gonna be bigger than journal article size projects. Uh, and, and I don't know. Uh, but maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, I know, I know it's true of my com other colleagues in the room because I know their work. It's that, that often I find the best ideas for the bigger projects from the side projects so that these things grow uh, for, for me. Uh, so that if I, I, I can't imagine doing the Charles V mass, but if I did, um, then one could imagine that there would be, that you would, it, there's a subject you might have been interested in in one way and then because you're in this, involved in this, you get very interested in the trumpet parts and then you can write a, a whole paper on just the trumpet parts because that all of a sudden you've seen it in a different Ways. And we try to, and we and we try to empower each member of the team to do that, so mm -hmm. that so that, for instance, if we're doing, if there's a web developer on the team and they write a, you know, a, a, a JavaScript library, right, for this project, they can take that and open source it and kind of claim that as their for their merit or their tenure or whatever whatever it is they're doing. 
that can be their side side project on the thing. So yeah, it can it can spin off in multiple directions. It doesn't have to be the only thing that's produced out of it. How do you? Uh, this is like a because I'm opposed to that question, but how do you balance the sort of aspirations of the studio and its sort of model versus like the use of contingent labor and as postdocs and graduate students and the sort of unflattening that will happen outside of the space when like those uh, collaborators are, are sort of having to talk about their work and, and sort of you know their their trajectories in the sort of wider world outside of greenhouse. Yeah, it's 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 hard. Um, it's, I mean, those those hierarchies persist in the room, um, and the facilitator's role is to try to level those, um, and then they persist when the people leave the room. Um, we are trying to, um, at least in our little space, change the way that works um, and to um, give people with less power permission to take some power and convince people with more power to give up some power. Um, and we're and we hope through that training that can seep out into the wider academy. Are we structurally making great strides in fixing the, <laughs> the, the contingent faculty labor market? No, right? But we are trying to change, you know, hearts and minds. Like, is there so like thinking of like you're working with postdocs now? Was there was there like a sort of plan to like replace those with more solid positions, potentially even with the postdocs, or is it kind of um, going to be rotating? So I, we don't have a plan to do that. We plan to have them be rotating rotating postdocs, mm -hmm. um, in part because I'm not sure this is a job that people would want to do. For their whole careers, but maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, I guess I started my career that way, so and I'm still sort of doing it. So maybe that is something people want to do for their whole career. Um, uh, the the other staff of Greenhouse Studios are are well, we're working on this, but will not be contingent. They are state employees with you know benefits, and pensions, and all of that, um, and we're hoping to keep keep it that keep it that way. So that postdoc layer may remain postdocs, but the rest, we're hoping that those won't be contingent, that those will be staff positions. Well, we might um, stop here. Thank Tom.